I want to share a few scriptures that Pastor Keith Moore is going to be going over, I believe, in the message tonight. And these are something that are important for us to remember in the realm of our finances, in our life, obviously. But I want to, I want to hone in on our finances right now. It's super easy when we're in a tight, tight spot or we're in a spot where it feels like money is. Have you ever feel like you've got holes in your pocket and money is just seeping out? How many of you know how easy it is to start complaining about what's going on instead of speaking faith? Of course, this is, this is in all of your life. It's so much easier to open your mouth and to murmur and complain than it is to speak faith and to speak God's word, isn't it? But I, I, want, I want to read this in 1 Corinthians chapter 10. We're going to start in verse 10, and it's recounting um, the Israelites, uh, and you know the story. And it says, and don't grumble as some of them did, speaking of the Israelites, and then were destroyed by the angel of death. These things happen to them as examples for us. So is this important for us? This happened to them as examples for us. They were written down to warn us uh, who live at the end of the age. Uh, and then I want to go to numbers. So th th this is important for us, right? And so we know that the Israelites, they got caught up in murmuring and grumbling and complaining. In fact, when you're reading this in, in numbers, you're thinking, I, these people, I do not want to be friends with these people. How many? I, I, that's what I thought when I'm reading this. And to think, and to think that I'm like that in a lot of life sometimes. Because a lot of times we read the Bible like, these Pharisees, Jesus, I mean, I get it, Jesus. These guys, I mean, the, can you believe these guys, the Pharisees? Like, yeah, can you believe yourself sometimes? Not that he, I mean, he says that in love, but for real. We, we, re, we think that, like, that's the Israelites. No, 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 no. They were written as an example for us. So, th so if it's an example for us, then there's a chance that we could be living the same way that they were. Okay? And so here's what happened to them. The Lord said to Moses and Aaron, he said something. Verse 27, how long must I put up with this wicked community and its complaints about me? Yes, I've heard the complaints the Israelites are making against me. Now tell them this, as surely as I live, declares the Lord, I will do to you the very things I heard you say. Whoa. You will drop dead in this wilderness because you complained against me. Every one of you who is 20 years old or older and was included in the registration will die. Verse 30. You will not enter and occupy the land I swore to give you. The only exceptions will be Caleb, son of Jephunneh, and Joshua, son of Nun. And you can either read this and you can think, wow, God, that's kind of harsh. But I think this, and I, I look at this and it's like, wow, God, that is so merciful. How merciful that you would allow them the opportunity and give them the very thing that they say. And this is the opportunity that we have tonight. God's watching over his word to perform it. What's going to happen is you will end up having the very things that you say. And so if it's complaining, if it's grumbling, if it's murmuring, guess what you're going to have? You will have the result of what you're, that is your expectation. You're voicing your expectation. But I love God. You know what he gave Joshua and Caleb? The very things that he heard them say. What did they say? They said, God said we can have this land so we can have this land. That's it. That's all they said. They said that and they stuck with it. And they entered the promised land. They did. Praise the Lord. So we're going to hear about this tonight. So if you, this is just a good place to catch ourselves. Are our words important? Yes, we've learned. It's a matter of life and death what we say. So it's very important for us to catch ourselves. If we're in a cycle of complaining and grumbling, we need to pull ourselves out of that. And we have the grace of God available to us to do so. Amen. I mean, let's pray and give, and we're going to get right into the message tonight. Father, we thank you so much for your word. Your word to us, it truly is life-changing. Thank you that it comes to us at just the right time. And that's our prayer tonight, Father. Uh, we open our hearts ready to receive from you, knowing uh, that our expectation is something that you will fill. And so we expect to receive uh, all that you have for us from your word tonight. And Lord, I just thank you for those who are giving right now. I just call them blessed. And I thank you that all of the finances coming into this place are being used to preach Jesus to everyone, everywhere from this place here in Alma, Arkansas. 
we call that money blessed. In Jesus' name, amen, amen. Go ahead and give, and then here in a few seconds, we'll uh, fire up the message for tonight. In Luke uh, 4, it said, verse uh, 32, they were astonished at Jesus' doctrine, for his word was with power. Jesus had manifestations of power in his life and ministry, and we see that the main way that these power manifestations occurred is when he spoke. It's directly connected to his words, him speaking. He would say something, and the moment he said it, power would manifest. This is not a coincidence. These are spiritual laws. Uh, it, are, are words important? They are far more important than most people have thought. Far more significant. Far more life directing than most church people acknowledge or believe. You can tell most people don't believe that life and death is in the power of the tongue by the way they talk. You can tell they don't. If they believed it, they wouldn't talk the way they talk. And all of us have made a lot of mistakes in our talking, so there's no judging or finger pointing, but are we going to learn? Are we going to grow up? Are we going to develop? Uh, the answer is Okay, yeah. <laughs> uh, go with me, if you would, to the book of Matthew and the 12th chapter. Matthew 12. We, we spent some time on this a week or so ago, but there's another part of it I want us to emphasize. And in Matthew 12, 33, Jesus the Master said, Either make the tree good and his fruit good, or else make the tree corrupt and his fruit corrupt. For the tree is known by his fruit. So he's talking about producing fruit. You could also say results. Producing fruit or results. O generation of vipers, how can you being evil speak good things? Now in the very next verse, he tells you how you're going to bring forth the good or bad fruit. You're going to speak it forth. You speak it forth and it, it is produced. It comes forth as you speak it forth. O generation of vipers, how can you being evil speak good things? For out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. The key to getting the right thing in your uh, mouth is to watch and hear and listen to the right thing and it gets in your heart. And uh, when it does, when your heart gets full of it, it'll come out of you without you even thinking it or planning it. It's whatever you're full of, that's what comes out when you're not thinking or, or being watched or when pressure is on, it's kind of like a, a, a sponge. Uh, if you squeeze it, whatever's in it comes out. And life will, will try to squeeze you. And you want to have the right thing in you when you get squeezed. He said, verse 35, a good man out of the good treasure of the heart brings forth good things. 
And, and how, do, how, does that, how do you do that? By speaking words. And an evil man out of the evil treasure brings forth evil things. How? By speaking words. Out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. And verse 36, but I say to you that every idle word that men shall speak, they shall give account thereof in the day of judgment. Now, a lot of folks have just wanted to stay away from that verse. They don't like it. It, it, it bothers them. But that's not, what you, that's not how you learn, is by avoiding things. And we found out that this word idle, it means non-working. Non-working. Uh, or um, uh, empty or, or vain. Or you could say it like this. Non-assigned, not assigned. Are we supposed to assign our words to do a job? That is completely different thinking than most people operate in. But it's how God himself operates. God never rants. And somebody say, thank God. Because everything he says comes to pass. Everything he says comes to pass. And he uses his words to create, to change. He uses his words to do something, to affect something. That's what we're supposed to do with our words. Now, we're very young spiritually. We're in babyhood and childhood stages of development. Most of the church is. And so folks are not realizing. When you're a baby, you don't know much. You're not very aware of what's going on. But if you grow up and develop, that's a big part of growing up, is that you realize I have a responsibility for every word that comes out of my mouth. Why would we be accountable even for idle, non-working words? Because the enemy can use words that are not assigned. He can use idle words to hurt and damage and do things that you didn't intend to do, but you threw them out there without thinking. How many want to make sure the enemy is not able to use your words? And you do want the Holy Spirit to be able to use your words. And you'll find that the enemy, through his spirits and cohorts, are continually trying to get things in your mouth that they can act on. And the Spirit of God is endeavoring to guide you into the truth and get words in your mouth that he can act on, that the angels of God can act on. And it's our choice. Uh, that's one of the big things about our will. It's our choice, the words we speak. We can choose any words and speak them and put what, whatever spiritual content we want to put in them. This is a God-like ability. The animals don't have this. This is a God-like ability. This is how God himself functions. He spoke and it was done. Hallelujah. Now, uh, go with me if you would. Well, excuse me, I didn't read this next verse, and this was the one I was trying to get to. Excuse me. Verse 36 and 37. Every idle word that men shall speak, they'll give an account thereof in the day of judgment. For by your words you'll be justified, and by your words you'll be condemned. Now, that word condemn is also translated judged. Same word, same King James Bible. So you can say it like this, judged or justified by your words. Somebody say, by your words. By, your words. by whose words? Your Not God's words. Not the devil's words. Not other people's words. Huh? 
See, you'll find people getting so upset about what other people say about them. But other people's words are not directing your life. Only yours. And so in many cases, it doesn't mean a thing what they said about you. It'll have no power in your life unless you let it. It doesn't even have to take a minute of your time unless you let it upset you. Who are they? And what does it mean? In the big scheme of things, <laughs> that they said something or tweeted something or texted something or posted something. What, what does it mean? There's a lot of junk going on and nobody will know about it or care day after tomorrow. Much less a century from now. Much less a, a thousand years from now. Their words are not directing you. Their words are not limiting you. Their words are not justifying you or judging you. But your words are. What you are saying about you is, di is directing and limiting and changing and blessing or cursing your life. And this is a Bible fact. This is something, a principle God has created and it functions all the time whether you think about it or whether you don't. Now, <laughs> y'all are quiet. You can make it work for you. Right? Can you? You can make it work for you, but you got to make an effort. Got to make an effort. Say it out loud, by your words. You'll be justified. By your words, you'll be judged. By your words. Look with me in uh, the book of uh, Exodus. And let's take a, a few moments here. Uh, the New Testament tells us to do all things without murmurings or disputings. Now that's uh, Philippians 2, 14. Put it on the screen if you would. You're going to Exodus 14. But Philippians 2, 14 says, Do all things without murmurings and disputings. You'll find that the Bible is very strong about not complaining. Why? Do, do how many things without complaining? All. How many things? All. So when do you get to complain? <laughs> do how many things? All. So what can you do and complain and it's okay? Do, do how many things? All. Do all things without murmurings and disputings. Now the word murmur you got Greek words and, and Hebrew words both that are translated murmur. And it actually is what is an omnipoetic word? That is, the word sounds the same as the action in the original language. And what that murmur, murmur, murmur. It's a low, uh, complaining expression. We'd call it grumbling which is also a Bible word, grumbling. It reminds me, did you ever see, uh, um, uh, what was it, Hillbilly Bears? That's an old one, cartoon. And Paul, Paul of the Hillbilly Bears, he was always, you could hate him understand him, but he's always, also reminds me of Muttley. Anybody remember Muttley in the cartoons? Well, I lost a bunch of people right there. They're like, what? <laughs> but there'll be young guys looking on YouTube this afternoon going, this is yeah, you'll be impressed too. It's interesting entertainment. Uh, but just that low grumble, I don't know. You know, why they have to do that for, I don't, it don't make no sense to me. And I, 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 
<laughs> I, I just described three fourths of the population. Right. Huh? Oh, yeah. And yet the Bible commands us not to do it. Why? Why? Just because it's a nice, good moral idea not to do it? Now, see, that's where the church has gone wrong. They think, well, yeah, it, yeah, I, I know I shouldn't. And I, I know we all do more than we should. And y'all pray for me. Why? It wouldn't do any good. You have no intention of changing. Ever. There's so much wasted motion in religious things. It matters. It matters. Go with me to 1 Corinthians 10. Actually, let's do it this way. 1 Corinthians 10. I'm, uh, I hadn't forgot about Exodus. But 1 Corinthians 10. He talks about what, verse 1, he talks about what happened with the Israelites, God's first covenant people that he delivered out of Egyptian bondage. Notice, he said, brethren, I would not have you ignorant how that all our fathers were under the cloud, all passed through the sea, all were baptized unto Moses in the cloud and in the sea, and did all eat the same spiritual meat, our food. Now what he's showing is how all of that is typical of our spiritual experience. How we were delivered out of bondage and darkness like they were delivered out of Egyptian bondage. And he talks about baptism. He talks about being fed spiritual food. See, all of that is a very vivid type and picture of what happens to you as a believer. They, they drank of the spiritual rock that followed them and that rock was Christ. The water coming out of the rock is a picture of Jesus. The water of life coming out of him. Can you say hallelujah? hallelujah. Verse 5, with many of them God was not well pleased for they were overthrown in the wilderness. These things were our examples to the intent we should not lust after evil things as they also lusted. Neither be idolaters as were some of them, as is written, the people sat down to eat and drink and rose up to play. Neither let us commit fornication as some of them committed and fell in one day three and twenty thousand. Neither let us tempt Christ as some of them also tempted and were destroyed of serpents. Neither murmur, whoa, whoa, whoa. <laughs> whoa, this is some strong company. Is that right? Idolatry, fornication. And complaining. In the same group? No. Don't, well, don't, why, why not murmur? Don't murmur as some of them murmured and were destroyed of the destroyer. Complaining makes you vulnerable to destruction. It's why we're commanded not to do it. It's not just that it's a bad thing or a bad idea. Complaining opens the door to the destroyer. And if he gets access, he's going to do it. He's going to destroy. If he can get to you, he's going to hurt you. And complaining allows him to get to you. Now, let's just stop. Do we believe that or not? Yes. Most of the church doesn't believe that. Do you believe that or not? How could you tell you believed that? You would quit. Is that right? If you really believed that if I start complaining, it'll let the devil get to me. You'd quit. I said you'd quit. You'd stop. So most people don't believe this. Most people, most church going people, the vast majority of church going people don't believe this. But I believe it. How about you? Are you going to join me? I, I make a decision to believe the word of God. And if he said, don't murmur so you don't get destroyed, then it must be serious. And do all things without murmuring. So we're going to make this a murmur-free church. 
We will be unique. <laughs> Come on, you with me or not? <laughs> Complaining free. Murmur free. Grumble free church. You need to make your home a grumble free zone. Right? Your workstation, a grumble free, complaint free place. You agree? Go to Exodus then. Let's look at what happened and why he says this. In Exodus, the 14th chapter from the very beginning when he brought them out of, uh, I mean, as soon as they left Egypt, they had traveled just a little ways and they got to the Red Sea. And Pharaoh and his armies bearing down on from behind. Exodus 14, 10, when Pharaoh drew near, the children of Israel lifted up their eyes. Behold, the Egyptians marched after them. They were so afraid, sore afraid, and the children of Israel cried out to the Lord, and they said to Moses, because there were no graves in Egypt, have you taken us away to die in the wilderness? Wherefore have you dealt with us to carry us forth out of Egypt? Is this not the word we did tell you in Egypt, saying, Let us alone that we may serve the Egyptians? Really? Remain slaves so that your children can be slaves and your grandchildren can be property? Really? It had been better for us to serve the Egyptians than that we should die in the wilderness. Yeah, but who said it was God's plan for you to die in the wilderness? He's already told you what the plan is, promised land. God didn't say anything about dying in the wilderness. He said promised land. But if God says promised land and you say die in the wilderness, which one will you get? Yeah, but God said promised land. If God says promised land is my will, and you say we're going to die in the desert, which one will you get? By your words, not his. Well, this is something. By your words, you'll either be justified or you'll be judged. He has determined it to be this way. Somebody said, well, God is God. He can do anything he wants to. Yeah, and he has decided that we should have a free will. And he has decreed that it be done according to what we chose to say and do. So that's how it's going to be. The way it's going to be is not the way he wants it for you. It's going to be the way you have chosen to believe and say. Even when it's completely contrary to his will, it's going to be according to what you said that you believed. The reason I read this, we're going to see it again, is because the enemy was able to get this in their mouth and on their mind that we're all going to die out here. And you will find every time something came up, that's the first thing came out of their mouth. We're all going to die out here. Now, have you read the scriptures? Have you heard the story? What happened? They all died out there. Right? Did it have anything to do with what they said? It was entirely based on what they said. I'm quoting Bible. It was entirely based on what they said. It was never the will of God. For them to wander around for 40 years in the desert and die out there, you know, prematurely and hard and wrong. That was never the perfect will of God. But he couldn't get them to quit complaining. They wouldn't do it on their own. And he's not going to force them. He's not going to make them override their will. So this word murmur here, then this is... This is the revelation I was talking about. In the Hebrew, we mentioned to you in the Greek, murmur. And actually in the Hebrew too, it's that omnipoetic word. The word sounds like the action it describes. <laughs> Murmuring is that low tone grumble complaint. 
But, but in the Hebrew, it's different. And I'd scratch my head thinking, how does that mean that? And the Lord helped me to see it. Murmur in the Hebrew means to stop. See, you're doing the same thing I was doing. It means to stop, to stay, to stay permanently. Murmuring means to stop and stay and stay permanently. It, it, it also means to be obstinate. It's kind of like a mule sitting down and stopping and won't move. And if you don't move, what happens? You stay right where you are. Look with me in Exodus. Uh, we, we saw that part. Exodus, the 16th chapter. Well, ex Exodus, uh, I'll read, you go to 16 and I'll read one on the way. Exodus 15, as soon as they uh, uh, got through the Red Sea, they just journeyed three days and they couldn't find water. And verse 24, Exodus 15, 24, the people murmured against Moses saying, what shall we drink? Now, um, in Matthew 6 and other places, Jesus said, don't say that. Don't say, what are we going to eat? Don't say, what are we going to wear? Mm -hmm. yep. Did the Lord say that or not? Yes. Why? Why? See, that's tied into complaining. I don't know what in the world we're going to do. Huh? Man, these prices are getting so high. Now, see, that just sounds like normal talk. Did I lose somebody? Somebody said, what's wrong with that? I'm trying to tell you what's wrong with it. Are you listening? We're reading scriptures. <laughs> I just don't know what in the world we're going to do. Man, it's, you know. Look at what these folks are doing. Look at what they're saying. Look at this, you know, this law. Look at this bill. Look at this thing. Look at this other. And if you listen to the news, you know what it is 24-7? Complaining? Judging? Is that right? It's why the enemy is pushing them so hard to just judge and complain and judge and complain. Why? Because he wants you to be judged so he can get to you. He wants you to open the door by complaining so he can get access to destroy without restriction. So he wants everybody judging and complaining, judging and murmuring nonstop. We're not ignorant of Satan's devices anymore. Amen. We're being enlightened. Is that right? Amen. Should we get a whole, we, can, we can't control the whole world. We can't control everybody around us. But we should be a witness and a light of a different way to talk. Amen. A different way to respond. Hmm? Not judging other people, not condemning other people. Why? So that you don't get judged. And not complaining so that you give access to the destroyer. They said, what are we going to drink? And the scripture called that murmuring. Hmm? Today, people just call it asking a question. I'm just asking a question. <laughs> Is that some crime? <laughs> well, do you want to be destroyed? <laughs> Help yourself. <laughs> I'll take some protection myself. I, I'll take some keeping power. I'll, I'll take some blessing. Hmm? 
I'll take shutting the door in the devil's face so he can't get in. I'll take not being judged. But it's not up to God. It's up to me. By my words. Say it out loud. By my words. I will be justified. Or judged. Blessed. Or cursed. By my words. That's what the Bible says. Matthew 12 and James 3. is what I just got through quoting. Referring to. So. What shall we drink is a complaint. They weren't just asking a question for information's sake. They're mad and put out with him. You've led us out here in the wilderness. What in the world are we going to drink? And what was the, what's the follow-on thought? We're all going to die out here. We're all going to die out here. Is that funny? No. Not unless you want to die out here. Exodus 16, are you there? Exodus 16, 1. They took their journey from Elam, and all the congregation of the children of Israel came into the wilderness of Sin, which is between Elam and Sinai. Verse 2, and the whole congregation of the children of Israel. This stuff is contagious. It spread through the whole bunch. These are hundreds of thousands of people. The whole bunch murmured against Moses and Aaron in the wilderness. And the children of Israel said to them, Would to God. We had died by the hand of the Lord in the land of Egypt. By the hand of the Lord. We wish God would have killed us in Egypt before we left. Stupidity. When we sat by the flesh pots. Oh, now we're going to talk about the good old days. The good old days. Back when we were somebody's property. Yeah, back when we got beat because we didn't turn in the right quota. Oh, yeah, fun days. <laughs> we were by the flesh pots. We ate bread to the full. We had, you brought us out in the wilderness to kill us. Why am I reading this? This is the murmuring that will get you destroyed. This is the complaining that will destroy your life. You brought us out here to kill us, to kill this whole assembly with hunger. So he, uh, they had said, what are we going to drink? Now they said, what are we going to eat? Well, you know, the Lord gave them manna. Verse 6 uh, and 7, he said, the Lord hears your murmurings against the Lord, and what are we that you murmur against us? Verse 8, it'll be the Lord will give you in the evening flesh to eat and in the morning bread to the full. For the Lord hears your murmurings which you murmur against him. And what are we? Uh, your murmurings are not against us, but against, against the Lord. Now see, they thought they were griping and complaining against Moses and Aaron. But the Lord was taking it personally. Because he's the one that sent Moses and Aaron. They're saying what he told them to say. And they don't realize it, but their words, are like Malachi says, their words the Lord considers to be stout against him. They are speaking directly against the Lord himself. But they're looking at Moses and Aaron when they were talking. So uh, there's a lot there in that chapter. I, I won't get to it. Exodus 17. I want you to see a recurring theme here. Exodus 17, 3, the people thirsted there for water. They ran short of water again. And so what did the people do? They murmured against Moses. Tell me what that would sound like. We're about to read part of it, but you could just hear grumbling throughout the, you know, what he thinks he's doing, dragging us all over this desert, nothing to eat, nothing to drink. We are going to die out here. We are going to die out here. Now we're laughing, but is it funny? No. That's how you die out there. And it won't be the desert that killed you. And it won't be Moses and Aaron that killed you. And it won't be the Lord that killed you. It'd be your own words. Oh, church, do we believe this? Most people won't, won't acknowledge it. They won't even consider it. But he has left it in our hands and in our mouth. They said, uh, 
why is it that you brought us up out of Egypt to kill us and our children and our cattle with thirst? And Moses said, what shall I do to this people? They be almost ready to stone me. Moses was concerned that they're just about to kill him. What an agitated, no joy, no peace, no direction, no respect for God, no respect for his leaders. Now skip down, if you would, to Numbers 14. And this is when it all came to a head. Numbers 14. There were actually, I only read what, about four of these episodes. We're about to read a fifth one. But there were ten sequential episodes of them doing this. Time, every time there was a shortage or a need or some danger presented, they immediately started grumbling and complaining and blaming, and they did it one, two, three, four, five, ten times in a row. And on the tenth time, the Lord said, that's it. What do you mean that's it? I'm about to read. He sent them, on this tenth one, is when they actually sent the spies into the promised land. Twelve, one from each tribe. And when they came back, they gave a report. Ten of the spies gave a bad report. Two of the spies gave a good report. You know, we sing the song sometimes, whose report? Will you believe? We will believe the report of the Lord. Boy, there's a lot to that. And the ten said, it's a terrible land. It's a land that will eat you up and spit you out. There are giants there. There are walled cities. They got iron chariots. I mean, these guys are like eight, nine, ten feet tall. I'm telling you, if you want to die, that's where you go. Do, do you see how much they have death in their mouth? It's, it's death. We're going we're gonna to starve to death. We're going to die of thirst. We're going to die of hunger. We're going to die from giants. We're going to die, we're going to die, 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 die. You'll notice if you, if you listen to secular music or, or, or secular poetry, it's full of death. Because the inspiration is from that. You know, I'm so lonesome I could <laughs> live. Huh? Huh? So blue, think I'm going to rejoice? No. No. Die. Die. Feel like I'm dying. Think I'm going to die. I'm going to die if I don't have this. So I'm going to lose my mind. Don't sing those songs. I said don't sing those songs. Don't, don't put them in your ears and your heart and mind. So verse 1, the congregation lifted up their voice and cried, and the people wept that night when they heard the report. And all the children of Israel, this is Numbers 14 too, they murmured against Moses and against Aaron, and the whole congregation said to them, Would God we had died in the land of Egypt, or would God we died in the wilderness? we I wish I had died over there. I wish I died here. Well, <laughs> is it that much difference dying one place or the other? And where, why has the Lord brought us into this land to fall by the sword that our wives and our children should be at prey? Wouldn't it be better for us to return to Egypt? And they said one to other, let's make a captain and let's return to Egypt. Let's go back. So they are firing which they never hired, <laughs> Moses and Aaron. And they are getting new leadership to take them back into bondage. Back into bondage. And verse 26, I won't go through all of it, but you know, uh, Joshua and Caleb tried to sway them 
and tried to convince them and said, look, the Lord's with us. Their defense is gone from them. We can take them. It's going to be a piece of bread, piece of cake. We can do this thing. You saw what God did back in Egypt. He's got us this far. He'll get us. And they wouldn't, they were ready to stone them. They were ready to kill Joshua and Caleb for saying that. Unbelief hates to hear faith talk. It irritates it. Makes it mad. Because it's showing up what you should be doing yourself. In your heart, you know what they're saying is right. But you just want to flesh out and cry and feel sorry for yourself. Grumble. I don't see why nobody helped me. And every time I try to do it, I, I all I was doing is asking a question. That's all I was doing. I was asking a question. What are we going to do? No, it's more than asking a question. You have resentment, and bitterness in your heart. You don't trust God. This is full out rebellion. Moses and Aaron, you're fired. We're electing new leadership. And we're going back to Egypt. Well, that was too much. Verse 26, the Lord spoke to Moses and Aaron saying, how long shall I bear with this evil congregation, which what? What was the thing that particularly irritated the Lord? Did the Lord hear their murmuring? The next, next phrase, I have heard. All that grumbling in the camp. I don't know. What in the world are we going to eat? How in the world are we going to make it? We're all going to die out here. The Lord was fed up with it. I have heard the murmurings of the children of Israel, which they murmur against me. He took it personally, even though they think they're murmuring against Moses and Aaron. Keep going. Say unto them, as truly as I live, says the Lord, as you have spoken in my ears, so will I do to you. Or are y'all with me? Verse 29, your carcasses shall fall in the wilderness and all that were numbered of you according to your whole number from 20 years old and upward which have murmured against me. Doubtless you will not come into the land concerning which I swore to make you dwell therein except, don't you know these boys were happy to hear this, <laughs> except, because <laughs> Caleb and Joshua were thinking, I'm in that age group. I'm in that age group. Nobody's making it in. And then he said, except. They thought, huh? Caleb, oh, yeah. And, and Joshua, buddy. Now, let's just stop right here. Why? They had a different report. They said something else because they believed something else. They chose something else. They had a different spirit, the Scripture said. Not a spirit of grumbling and complaining. A spirit of faith. I said a spirit of faith. A spirit of faith is not a complainer. If you're grumbling, that's not faith. If you're faith, there's no grumbling. Faith doesn't complain. Faith doesn't grumble. Faith rejoices. Is glad about something. Doubtless you'll not come into the land which I swear to make you dwell therein. Say, except Caleb, the son of Jephunneh, and Joshua, the son of Nun. Keep going. Your little ones that you said would be a prey, you said, Dad, I'm going to bring them in. And they'll know the land which you have despised. But as for you, your carcasses they shall fall in the wilderness. Where have we heard this before? We all going to die. Huh? Where have we heard it before? We all going to die in the wilderness. And what did the Lord say? Verse, verse 28. As you have spoken in my ears. Does that sound like by your words? By your words. And, and, and I saw this when we were talking about that definition. The word murmur in the Hebrew, it means to stay. 
or to stop or to stay permanently. They didn't go into the promised land. They stopped in the wilderness and they stayed in there. Why? Because that's what they said. And their complaining stopped their forward progress. And their complaining caused them to stay in the middle of what they're complaining about. Can you see that or not? Don't complain unless you want to stay in it. Unless you want to stay in the thing you're complaining about, stop it. I, then I, I saw it. It freezes your progress. It wasn't God's plan for them to perish out in the wilderness. It wasn't his plan for them to wander around and circle around for 40 years. You know why it was 40 years? Because he said so in this same chapter. He said, a year for each day that, you know, the, the spies went and checked out the land for 40 days. Again, it was them. They had 40 days to see how right God was, how good that land was. They brought back the giant cluster of grapes. You remember that? It was beautiful. It was green. It was flourishing. It was well watered. It was everything that the Lord said. It had a few giants on it. Huh? It had a few giants on it. God already knew that. Had a few walled cities. God already knew that. But when they kept complaining about it and they kept saying, we're all going to die out here in the wilderness, there came a point where God said, okay, you're going to have what you say. You won't say what I want you to say. What did he want them to say? What Caleb and Joshua were saying. They were his mouthpieces on that thing. What did he want them to say? We're going in. We're going in. God is with us. We can do this thing. We can take this thing. Right? The enemy, there. what does it matter how big they are? God's bigger than everybody. And their defense is departed from them. It's our land. We are possessing what he gave us. If they'd have said that, they would not have wandered for 40 years in the wilderness. They would not. They would have gone straight in and they would have won battle after battle after battle. Jo under the leadership of Joshua, they proved it could be done. God did it through them. He did it through the next generation. So it's not true. Oh, come on, friends. Do you see this? The giants did not keep them out. The walled cities did not keep them out. If it, if it really was what kept them out, it would have kept Joshua and the other people out. Uh-uh. God's bigger than all that. The desert is not what killed those people. It was their mouth. Can you see this or not? It was their mouth. Is it true? Death and life is in the power of the tongue. And they that love, whatever they love, whatever you say, you'll eat the fruit of that. Did they eat the fruit of what they said? It was bad fruit. It was bad. But the, why, did, why did the Bible tell us time after time after time after time? It gives you the exact quote. I mean, the Bible didn't waste space with unnecessary information. It, it gives us a quote in their language. They said, why would you bring us out here? We're all going to die out here. We're all going to die out here. We're all going to die out here. And after months and months and ten successive failures, the Lord said, okay. Okay, you're going to get exactly what you said. You're going to die out here in the wilderness. Now, what does that have to do with us? 1 Corinthians 10, we just read in the New Testament, says that these are specific examples for us. What are you saying? What are you saying over your life? How much complaining is okay? How much? We're going, to, we're going to par it down, you know, no. do 20% less or what? 
Huh? No. Or just have, you know, one day a week we complain? No. no. <laughs> <Stop>. <laughs> Complaining Wednesday or whatever it is. <laughs> how about none? none. No, well, how much destruction do you want? None. How much do you want to get stuck in your problem no. to where you never come out? No. Hmm? Ooh, how do you like them apples? It's good apples, aren't they? This is the word, man. This is the word. And sometimes we need to hear how much complaining is okay. Zero. You know, I, I think it's tough when we hear something like this because our natural inclination is to say, that's not possible for me to complain none. Now tell me, is that true? If God said, don't complain then you are able to not ever complain. This is the beauty of free will and the grace of God which has empowered us to live by the way he told us to. And so what happens is sometimes on this journey, we'll say, that's not possible. I can never not complain at all. And so we never even try. But it's possible. And it's like a lot of things. You'll start getting momentum once you start doing it, and you'll learn, wow, I really can live my life and not complain. But you've got to start. You've got to start. We've got to start somewhere. And I want to hit on one thing real quick, simply because of what we've been talking about, what Pastor Nate has been talking about lately, about a house in order. We've been talking about authority and spiritual authority, haven't we? And I love what he brought out there, that... The people of Israel, they thought that they were complaining against Moses and Aaron, but God took it personal. And the Bible says that all authority, who's all authority from? It's from God. So when we're complaining about those in authority over us, who do we think we're complaining against? We're complaining against God. And he takes it personal. And I, I bring this up because it's probably the easiest thing that we can do is to complain about our boss to complain about uh, anyone in authority over us in government? I mean, come on. I mean, and we haven't thought for a moment that God's taken that personal. This is important. It's, it's important for us. And I want to go ahead and I want to read this last thing. I was going to say in on a positive note, but it's a positive note when I get corrected. When I get corrected, I'm going this way and I get corrected because I'm heading towards destruction because I've opened the door to the destroyer and I get corrected and I get to shut the door then. That's a positive note. I get to shut the door on the destroyer because I'm going to obey God's word, right? But I want to read what happened for, the, for Caleb, for Joshua, who chose not to complain. They got to enter the promised land. We know this. But I love what Caleb says in Joshua chapter 14. They came to Judah. Uh, they, they had, uh, they've conquered a few places. Caleb, the son of Jephunneh, the Kenizzite, said to him, he was talking to Joshua, you know the word which the Lord said to Moses, the man of God, concerning you and me in Kadesh Barnea. I was 40 years old when Moses, the servant of the Lord, sent me to spy out the land, and I brought back word to him as it was in my heart. Nevertheless, my brethren who went up with me made the heart of the people melt, but I wholly followed the Lord my God. So Moses swore on that day, saying, Surely the land where your foot is trodden shall be your inheritance and your children's forever, because you have wholly followed the Lord your God. And now behold, the Lord has kept me alive, as he said, these 45 years. 45 years later. He's 85 years old now. He's 85 years old. He says, and yet I'm as strong this day as on the day that Moses sent me. Just as my strength was then, so is my strength for war, both for going in and for coming out. Now give me this mountain of which the Lord spoke in that day. Man, he got, he got exactly what the Lord said he would get. And all of his brethren back then got exactly what they say they would get. It's important, and I love... I love how Pastor Keith Moore lays it out. Are we reading the Bible? Do we believe the Bible? Guys, it's that simple, and so now it's decision time. We can either choose to live by what we've been taught. We're now accountable for what we've heard. 
And so for us to put it off and to not do it, we're accountable for what we've heard. We're accountable for it. And like he said, I want this to be a church. I want this to be a place here in Alma, Arkansas, where there's a people there that when I'm around them, I don't hear the same things that I'm hearing everywhere else. And as a result, we're going to be walking in things that other people aren't walking in. And they will be drawn to that. And that's what preaching Jesus looks like. There's got to be something different about us. There's got to be. There's got to be because we want people to come to him. So we need to look like him more. I, I don't see Jesus complaining much when I'm reading the Gospels. And by much, I mean not at all. Not at all. Are you encouraged by this? Man, I'm encouraged. You want to, well, come on, come say something then. All right, go ahead and then wrap this up. Okay, so uh, he basically said this uh, at the very end there, but as I was sitting there uh, towards the end, I was just thinking, you know, we sing the song, we've heard it ever since we were little, Jesus loves me, this I know. Say that part again. For the Bible tells me so, and so we just embrace that, you know. Jesus loves me, this I know, for the Bible tells me so. Death and life are in the power of the tongue, this I know. Right? And, and so it's just, it's like he said, we, um, we want to be a people that believe God's word. We've all had different experiences. We've all grown up differently. We've all had uh, how we think shaped in a different way. But God is so good and he is so kind to bring us uh, into a place of, of his truth and his ways. Why? So we can walk in life and not destruction. Amen. And so it is really as simple as that when we read this in God's Word. And that's why we say so many times, don't just sit here and listen to someone talk. Look at what God is saying in His Word and be determined. No matter what I feel, no matter how I've been brought up, no matter what I think I know, I'm going to choose to believe this right here. And I'm going to change how I think, and I'm going to change how I act according to God's Word. Death and life are in the power of the tongue. This I know, for the Bible tells me so. And, and so it is, it really is a simple choice. It's a simple choice. And, and when we have opened the door to the destroyer, we can shut it. Amen. Thank God for the blood. Thank God for repentance. Thank God for the blood of Jesus and shut the door. Amen. For the Bible tells me so. Amen. Thank you, Lord. Father, we thank you for your word tonight. We thank you that your words are spirit and they are life unto us. And so, Father, I just thank you that that your word and your truth has been ministered tonight. And I thank you that you have given us a free will, that you have given us a choice, that you did not make us robots. But just as you uh, told us in your word, I've set before you uh, death and life, blessing and cursing, now choose life. And we are a people. I, I, I just, uh, I, I decree this tonight over this house that we are a people uh, that chooses life. That we are a people, we are believers and we believe you, Lord. Oh, so I thank you. I just thank you. I thank you for ships turning. <laughs> I thank you for lives turning um, uh, tonight. That, that changes are made tonight. Uh, I thank you for words of life, Lord. I thank you that you didn't, you didn't leave us to come up with words of life. You gave us words of life. So I thank you for your word that is full of life to fill our hearts and our mouths with. Glory to God. We give you honor in Jesus' name. And everyone said, Amen.
So grab your kiddos and then join us over in the youth building. We're going to tell Pastor Nate happy birthday, Mike Shepard's birthday. Wave, Mike. Wait, happy birthday to Mike, Docky Brazier's birthday today. So we're just going to go celebrate some birthdays.